this technology, meaning the, the in general, general, this in general. trend. Yeah. I, it's, it's, I, I think it's great, actually, I'm sitting here between you guys, and you do both have, you, there are sort of different verticals, or, or sorry, different business models at play here, and I think that um, the, the technology, generally just the more availability of digital technologies in the developing world in the last 10 years has created this um, climate where we're right now seeing a ton of uh, experimentation and some things actually coming to scale of uh, different ways of, of, of uh, supercharging the labor market, right? So we've got you know, these online job listings, we've, we've got uh, the working remotely, um, and they're, they're both think of them as um, new opportunities relative to what a self-employed or a would-be self-employed person may have had um, in the informal sector 10 or 15 or 20 years ago in, in any of the countries you, you had listed you've got, um, you've got folks in. Um, whereas before somebody really could only consider uh, selling their labor um, or trying to kind of you know, get some inputs and, and make a go of it for their family, uh, in their neighborhood, and they may hold down five different fractional jobs with their with their family. Now maybe these things are are a little bit helpful. And what we're seeing is a lot of kind of organic, um, uh, constructed uh, networks of opportunity seeking. So people use the the phones not just as a pure replacement for their local networks, but as uh, a way to empower you know supercharge their local networks. So you get a customer. Yeah, um, and now you can keep that customer more easily. You know, you can send them the the the, the Christmas greetings or whatever, the holiday greetings on the on the SMS, or you can wait for somebody to kind of call you with a new order or something like that. We've seen a great uh, kick up in in both productivity and in customer search and market opportunities. All this coordination that can be done with the simple technologies. But if the first stage was um, Getting that network in place, you know, just getting simply the the the, the mobile cellular network to cover 90% of the people on Earth, um, and the handsets to be cheap enough and the prepay models to be good enough that anybody could self-organize and use the technology as best they could. That I mean, we we, we kind of see where that's going right now. It's already a good thing, but it's this next level of of innovation where we're building platforms and and places for exchange and and you know vertical specific things in agriculture, for example. Where um, it's just this great, it, it's a it's a great period of, of experimentation. What right are now. the biggest constraints right now? I think um, we, in the mobile space, um, the the good has been the enemy of the perfect a little bit in the way the networks are priced and built. We've got all this stuff out there, but they tend to be pretty expensive to use on an ongoing basis. So it's no longer hard to acquire a phone and use a phone in a micro enterprise. Anybody can afford to do that, but they can't afford the phone bill on a monthly basis or on a weekly basis, and it's all prepay and everything like that. So uh, there are models uh, that we would like to do here in a very bandwidth-rich kind of environment. Um, you know, have somebody always on that kind of thing. Like maybe that you know, I don't know who pays for those six screenshots every hour, but that's What's that's that, data that across the network, right? And yeah. so, so there there are ways in which I think if we if we can. Um, you know, continue to kind of think about you know getting getting more out of bandwidth we have and pricing that differently or you know pricing it aggressively and all that. That is a constraint. Um, and then, completely different from the platform or anything like that is is just skills, right? That that you know you're still only as valuable as the skills you can market yourself having. And this becomes a non-digital question. I don't know what your thoughts on on it. Sorry, we do the digital and then the non-digital. So the digital. So yeah, how does it, how does the pricing work? If I'm Who's paying for the six screenshots an hour? Well, um, uh, the, the worker's paying for their own internet. We're, but of course, at the money they're earning via the, the web, that's not, an, that's not really an issue, right? And what language? Is it all in? Um, right now, we're, it's, uh, it's all English, but we're truly global. We're, uh, we're m most of our clients are in the uh, English-speaking countries. Most of the workers are in the countries I said earlier, right? So the Philippines, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Eastern Europe. Um, and, and so on. We're in about 140 plus countries. Uh, one thing to note, in the Philippines, they, the phone company has extra bandwidth. So they have these trucks that drive around and think of it as a mobile Wi-Fi and it can pull up somewhere, open the doors, they roll out some mobile desks and people are working from these hotspots that are mobile hotspots. Hmm. And they pay, you know, two bucks an hour or whatever to be, uh, uh, to be connected for a, for a session at these uh, mobile hotspots. Hmm. 
Uh, the, the non-digital question? So. Yeah, I mean, in terms of skills, I think, uh, you know, we will add technological aspects to the way that the working world and the labor market is shaped, but it still is a labor market at the end of the day. So you're still going to have to warn and demonstrate that you possess the skills you purport to have. Um, and, uh, you know, there are tremendous opportunities to build your skills by participating in an ODESC-like environment or a Souptel-like environment. Uh, but again, I mean, I believe that supply and demand and the constraints and the challenges that are implicit in that kind of equation will, will persist. Uh, if you say that you're an excellent worker, you're going to have to demonstrate it. Uh, by the same token, if you uh, get matched with a job through our service, you do still have to go to an interview, demonstrate to the employer that you're capable of doing the job, and they'll find out fairly quickly whether that's the case. So uh, some of the baseline issues and uh, challenges and opportunities I think are going to remain the same even if we uh, strap the facade of technology onto it. But in terms of access, I mean, that's I think where the real, uh, the game-changing multiplier is going to be. Uh, Whereas, you know, job opportunities and, and employment positions were previously limited to people who had good social networks, good resources, good upbringing, good education, this is really going to democratize the labor market so much more. We're focusing right now specifically on tackling this trend of uh, rural to urban migration, uh, the notion that, you know, on a daily basis you have tens of thousands, if not greater numbers of people flocking to major cities. Um, and the kind of work that we do, uh, particularly uh, now in, in the Middle East, is really focusing on smaller urban centers and rural environments and how we can link people with positions available there. Hmm. Uh, so, uh, again, a increasing access to those uh, who have not previously been able to participate in the labor market is, is something that this technology can really help. And are there institutional or regulatory barriers that you have to overcome? Uh, no. I mean, uh, on the contrary, I would say in most cases, wherever we cooperate with a ministry of higher education or a ministry of labor, uh, they're more than happy to see a low-cost, high-volume solution to some of the problems we're facing. Uh, we interact very regularly with Ministry of Labor in Palestine, in Jordan as well, in Morocco, uh, across the region, uh, Ministry of Higher Education uh, in those countries as well. And again, coming from a resource-constrained environment, um, any type of high volume, cost effective solution to tackling labor market mm. mismatches is very welcome. Uh, and Gary, you said you do business in 140 odd countries. So is, what's that like dealing with regulatory and institutional barriers? Uh, that's a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we've, uh, we've spent a lot of money on lawyers. There's two types of compliance we have to worry about. Um, first is, is money transmission. When you're moving money across borders, you have to make sure that you're doing that in a legal and compliant way, and there's tons of um, regulation around that. We have to uh, uh, know who our customers are. We have to have um, uh, full uh, AML audits and, uh, you know, uh, at AML? least yeah, AML, uh, um, anti-money laundering. Yeah, I should leave this to the bankers, too. <laughs> to, but um, uh, AML, and we've had to put a ton of hurdles in place. Um, for bo on both the client side and the contractor side. And then uh, the way we move the money. We have to ring fence the money that's uh, contractors. We can't uh, put it on our balance sheet. We have to hold it in a separate account for the benefit of the contractor and, and the like. So moving money has proved to be uh, challenging and we're constantly investing more in that regard. And the second is around worker compliance and labor compliance. So we've tackled two pretty thorny issues. Now the good news here is that the world and the landscape is moving very quickly uh, around worker compliance and I'm not sure if I mentioned it we spoke earlier to some folks and we mentioned that in Bangladesh they passed a law that says any dollars earned via the internet are tax-free so here's a forward-thinking government that realizes wait a second we have all this underemployed population who can't get jobs and we don't want them to leave our country we want them to stay is there a way that they can make money here well sure there is how about bringing jobs into Bangladesh so they're out trying to get businesses to set up shop there and you know they'll go and court Microsoft and say hey come to Bangladesh we have thousands of workers and we'll give you a beautiful building and lots of tax advantages for coming here but that's years to get that done they have to plan and it's very strategic in the long term and we think fantastic but the internet enables work to go today Right? The internet can be the roads in to these geographies where there are no roads. And so um, we, we're seeing this forward-thinking behavior by uh, folks like Bangladesh to be the changing landscape. And we're tackling country by country worker compliance to the point where you have to declare whether it's an employer or a contractor. If it's a contractor, we have your back. If it's an employee, we have your back. And, uh, and it's a pretty heady task. And uh, what about the local employers? Are they thrilled to have you show up? 
Uh, local employers are thrilled because, again, it's a global uh, platform. And so, you know, you first and foremost, let's just talk about the U.S. So we went out and surveyed our customers. We had over 7,000 of our customers come back and tell us that these are jobs that would not exist if not for a platform like Odesk. Four out of five told us this is lift, not shift. So would you have hired locally? No. I wouldn't have hired locally. This job didn't exist locally. Right. If I couldn't get, find. But what about the employers who are not on your platform? Aren't you creating a new source of competition for labor for them? Um, uh, it's, it's quite the opposite. I think I'm I'm uh, creating a new opportunity for them now, limiting their search. So let me ask a question: What's the likelihood that the best person in the world for that job exists within a 50 mile radius? And even if it does, are you going to find them? Can you compete? So in Silicon Valley, for example, um, all, our clients are thrilled. They can't. Right. I mean, they if, can't. I'm, if I'm employing Philippine nurses and suddenly I'm not, nobody comes and works for me because they can make five times as much working for you, does the local non-ODESC employer provide, present a, uh, a problem for you? Or you know, I would say no, based on the fact that we're not even scratching the surface right. of what's possible here. And again, we're not talking all work. <laughs> We're talking a percentage of work. Right, right now, it's so small. I, I mean, we have 90 employees in our company. We have about 225 full-time equivalent contractors that are coming to work for us every day. So we're eating our own cooking. We use our own platform like we expect our customers to. And I'll tell you, there, there isn't 225 jobs for us in Silicon right. Valley. We couldn't afford to yeah, house them. What about them. the technological infrastructure? I mean, I get frustrated working remotely from my house in Northwest DC, given the speed sometimes. Is that an issue for you? Uh, we have a desktop client that every contractor needs to download. And once they download that, in order to get paid, they actually have to log in to the team room or the company or the specific job that they're going to be working on. And for that, you need an internet connection. But once you've logged in, if the, if the internet is intermittent or if it shuts down or if it, it's in and out, um, we, um, we can cache. So when you do get a connection back, all of the, the, the uh, functionality is still there. Hmm.